Coming up on This Week in Law, we have Ryan Kahlo, Ryan Davidson, and James Daly. We'll be talking about surveillance, facial recognition, robots, artificial intelligence, a number of things having to do with the investigation of the Boston Marathon bombing. And we'll be talking about why you shouldn't film yourself getting drunk and posting that online if you're driving. All of that next, coming up on Twill. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law, episode 207, recorded April 19th, 2013. Bad Robots. This episode of Twill is brought to you by ShareFile. Enhance your workflow, send files of almost any size easily and securely with ShareFile by Citrix. Try ShareFile today. For a 30-day free trial, go to sharefile.com, click the radio microphone, and enter Twill. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 207 of This Week in Law. I'm Evan Brown, standing in for Denise this week. She is away uh, so I'm holding down the fort and looking forward to a really interesting conversation this week. You know, it's been, uh, you know, a pretty bizarre week. That's for sure. One of the most bizarre weeks in uh, news and, you know, maybe in U.S. history, certainly in, in recent memory. So plenty of issues that kind of can underlie some of the discussion that we can have. Uh, and we'll get into that. But let me introduce you to uh, our panel. First, uh, welcome back to the show, Ryan Kahlo. Uh, Ryan's a professor at the University of Washington. How's it going, Ryan? It's going really well. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, great. It's great to uh, great to have you back. Looking forward to, to talking with you. Another Ryan on the show, Ryan Davidson, coming to us uh, from Fort Wayne, Indiana, right? Is that where you are, Ryan Davidson? Uh, for the moment, that's correct. Good to be here. Yes, yeah. And uh, Ryan Davidson, along with uh, your colleague, I guess you would put it, James Daly. Hi, James. Hi. And the two of you write um, Law in the Multiverse, a very interesting blog talking about a number of uh, issues, theoretical and, and real, that deal with uh, superheroes, robotics, all kinds of, uh, of hypothetical things. So, so looking forward to, uh, to, to talking to you about uh, some of the issues that you've written about recently and uh, some, some other interesting things as they come up here. For those of you watching live on uh, on video right now and watching after the fact for that matter. I apologize for the uh, sluggishness, the jitteriness of my video. I'm not sure what the issue is here. So I hope that uh, together we can not be too distracted about that uh, and have a good conversation uh, nonetheless. So yeah, as I was uh, alluding to at the beginning, it's been a really weird week. Um, you know, several several stories, each of which would, uh, you know, in their own uh, in, in their own uh, significant, you know, each of which are significant in their own right. You know, of course, the bombing in Boston at the Boston Marathon on Monday, the ricin scare. You know, this guy from Mississippi is alleged to have sent ricin-laced correspondence to a senator and also to uh, to President Obama. CISPA uh, passed the House that uh, legislation that's uh, really threatens uh, or could threaten our Fourth Amendment privacy rights. There was the big explosion at the fertilizer plant in Texas, you know, at least 12 people dead from that. There's been flooding here in Chicago that's closed schools for two days, and the Chicago River is actually moving in the right direction. You know, early in the 20th century, they reversed the flow for pollution reasons. Now it's actually going back into Lake Michigan like nature intended. There's a big earthquake in Iran and Pakistan. Um, the gun control bill failed in the Senate. A lot of outrage about that. Pat Summerall died for sports fans. So, you know, where are the good old days of last week when we were only worried about, uh, you know, nuclear war with, with Korea? So it's been, a, it's been an interesting week uh, uh, and, you know, certainly some things that we can talk about uh, with that. In the news this morning, um, where we are now with the Boston bombing thing is, of course, yesterday uh, afternoon, uh, the FBI released photos of the two suspects, and um, there's there was the big uh, shootout during the night. One of the suspects is now dead, and the other guy is uh, on the the run. At least that's where we are now. That news is likely to change in the time that we're on on uh, the show here now. So. 
one of the big things, one of the big factors in the identification of these suspects and the, and the, uh, the way in which the FBI communicated this information yesterday was through the use of uh, surveillance video, apparently from, um, I know that earlier in the week there was talk about Lord and Taylor had in Boston had a surveillance video camera set up. And Ryan Kahlo, I wonder if you'd be willing to comment what the significance of this is in relation to our privacy rights. And, you know, how would you address the, the difference between how we should think about our privacy rights in public surveillance like this and the interest that we have in tracking down bad guys like we are here in uh, tracking down the guys who are responsible for the the, the Boston uh, Marathon uh, bombing. How, would you comment on that? Sure. So um, the fact that there was video um, uh, of the suspects from Lord and Taylor or wherever the source uh, happened to have been um, you know, it reminds us that uh, there is a lot of surveillance uh, of public um, of, of, of you know in public these days, uh, but also it reminds us that that surveillance is largely atomized, meaning that um, it's not as though we are living in London where there are a bunch of cameras belonging to the government that are all linked together. At least not not everywhere, right? So um, you know there's there's either talk or actual deployment of linked government cameras uh, in certain cities. Uh, but in general, you know, a lot of it's atomized. And so it's ATM cameras. It's cameras that have a purpose that is really, you know, rather limited, you know, limited usually to loss prevention, uh, security, van, you know, vandalism at a, large, as a large, at a small scale. And what that permits is that after the fact, when there's been a terrible tragedy, when there's something specific to investigate, uh, we are then, the government is then able to access that video footage as it, if it needs to, as long as it does it in a timely way uh, that uh, so that it's not destroyed because often these places have data retention policies where they destroy video after a certain amount of time. I think that the impulse will be, you know, gosh, we found these um, suspects through video. Uh, we ought to put video everywhere. We ought to put uh, video cameras all over the place um, because that will somehow permit us to. Um, uh, well, well, I'm not sure, right? So. In, in a sense, the fact that we actually do have these people on footage means that the system is working reasonably well. Um, and so I think that the only thing else we could have done uh, would be to prevent the tragedy uh, by having cameras in place. Um, but, you know, I've never seen very convincing evidence that having cameras on everywhere all the time can actually stop this kind of tragedy from occurring because think about what you'd have to do. I mean, you'd have to in real time somehow monitor uh, people flagged that they're suspicious. I'm not aware that these two particular perpetrators were ever on anyone's radar, so it wasn't like we had pictures of them when we're looking for them that I know of. Um, it would be an enormous logistical challenge to try to leverage uh, ubiquitous surveillance by the government. And meanwhile, that would present a lot of uh, dangers uh, that would accompany uh, ubiquitous government surveillance uh, coupled with, uh, you know, facial recognition and so forth. Um, and so in a sense, it's like it's worked for investigative purposes. I'm not sure it's an argument for uh, greater deployment of surveillance for prophylactic purposes. Do you think that it's always going to remain so atomized, though? Uh, just, you know, less than a month ago, Mayor Bloomberg on a uh, radio show, Mayor Bloomberg, Bloomberg of, uh, of New York City, was uh, essentially dismissing the fact that uh, five years from now, there could be surveillance cameras on every corner. Uh, people shouldn't be worried about this being uh, Big Brother. Just uh, get on with it. I'm wondering if uh, the the change would con or the 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 concerns that we have about this would change if it's not so atomized. If there is unification and uh, a combination with you know the combination of more cameras plus big data analysis to kind of generate meaning from this information in, in real time, would that change the uh, the impact it has on our on our privacy concerns at all, Ryan Kahlo? So, um, yeah, the, the, sort of Bloomberg is, is the new, uh, what is it, McNeely, right? Uh, you know, privacy is dead, uh, get over it. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, people are always uh, announcing the death of privacy. It seems like every headline you read, every blog post, uh, 
comes up with a new, and I'm guilty of this myself, um, comes up with a new technology and says, okay, now privacy is dead. Uh, it never fully dies. Um, and part of that has to do with the fact that it's a value that we really, we really care about. Sometimes we have difficulty articulating the harm. Sometimes we have difficulty balancing privacy as against other interests like security. Um, it never totally goes away. And so the idea that anyone's going to just sort of quote unquote get over it uh, as the mayor uh, intimated and as, and as, you know, was it uh, Sun Microsystems a, a guy did uh, years ago? It's just, it's just, it just seems, strikes me as factually inaccurate. Um, I mean, look at the pushback that we've gotten over the domestic use of drones. Um, that has really captured the public imagination. And now states are moving to, um, to legislate. And then there have been a couple of states already that have moved to legislate. And in fact, there's federal legislation that um, you know, may be introduced uh, uh, going forward. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, people can say anything. You can, I, I can sit here and say, um, you know, we'll never allow uh, you know, linked cameras in our, in our cities and there will be a privacy revolution. So what? So I said it. Um, the truth of the matter is, is that um, you will see. And, and if history is any example, there will be points of pushback. And it's not necessarily an inexorably all in one direction uh, expansion of surveillance. Um, and in fact, if anything, uh, some of the recent um, surveillance technologies that have developed, like drones, have been all the more visceral and have elicited um, sort of a return to hardware. So we're actually eliciting more of a um, more of a reaction than than some of the developments that have preceded it. So you know, I, I don't agree with the mayor, even as a predictive matter. Um, although I think that things like the Boston uh, bombing uh, will make many think that that's the right move. James, what do you think um, about about this question of of uh, the risk to our our privacy from having more uh, surveillance? Are you concerned that uh, there there's uh, privacy uh, you know protections that we have that are eroding away here, especially uh, with the sensibilities uh, that might change because of the greater fear of of terrorism? Well, I think that. Cameras, uh, widespread cameras, are a great investigative tool. The fact that you know everybody walks around with a camera and nowadays in their pocket, or at least the vast majority of people do, I think. And the fact that many stores, or most stores, I think, have surveillance cameras and that kind of thing. It's a great investigative tool after the fact. But as you point out, it's just almost impossible uh, beforehand to use them as an uh, in a, a um, a preventative in a preventative way, and it's, it's just statistics. Um, um, you know, the, the prior probability that any given person is up to no good is very, very, very low. But after the fact, once you know that that a crime has occurred in a particular place, then sure, it's it's much, much easier to then concentrate your investigative efforts in a particular place and comb through that much, much, much smaller bit of evidence um, and to find uh, suspects. And that's exactly what we saw in Boston. Um, the idea of looking everywhere across the entire country all the time continuously for some kind of suspicious behavior, it, well, the number of false positives that you turn up would make it completely unmanageable. And it would, it would that the, the problem of false positives, I think, is, is the bigger problem to me than the privacy issue as such. Because in public places, for example, we already don't really have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, if you have cameras that are pointed at public streets and public plazas and that kind of thing, uh, you already don't have much of uh, privacy as it is. So, uh, I mean, as a practical matter, people sort of think that they they don't need to be recorded all the time or shouldn't be recorded all the time, but but really when push comes to shove, shove they could be. Um, but I think the the real issue with that kind of with uh, that kind of pervasive surveillance would be that what would happen is that there would be a lot of false positives. Those people would be investigated, and there be uh, it would amount to you know their lives would be upended, and even you know and then there would be the problem of a lot of them they would eventually be exonerated, but some would necessarily uh, there would be sort of f convincing false positives where. Um, they, they would be the, the innocent people who ended up being um, found guilty even so um, and uh, they, or, or who had to really, really work hard in order to exonerate themselves. And that would be to me the, the, the even bigger problem 
uh, to taking that kind of approach. So yeah, widespread widespread use of cameras, great after the fact. Boston shows that, um, but I think yeah, taking it one step further and saying we should turn it into a panopticon surveil, you know, active surveillance state kind of thing. That I think that yeah, there's a big big drawbacks. Ryan Davidson, uh, want to get your comments on that. On, on what James was saying about false positives. You know, I was engaged in a conversation on Twitter yesterday about this very thing because I put up a tweet saying this is where the rubber meets the road when it comes to balancing our privacy interests and facial recognition databases that, that law enforcement have. You know, that, that, that in, a, in a time like this, when you've got uh, photos of, of a suspect, uh, wouldn't it be nice just to run that by some some database and you know figure out immediately who they are? I mean, in this situation, it's only taken 12 hours after the release of the information to uh, you know make some real progress on on tracking the guys down. But um, one of the one of the responses that I got in that conversation on Twitter is you know this very issue that that James is raising. What about the positives? And the question that I would have for you is: Is that enough of a reason to to not really be progressive when it comes to the use of these technologies? More surveillance, more use of facial recognition, uh, given the fact that there have been false positives uh, before, that there are false positives now just by having you know somebody use their eyes to to look at something. You know, the the perfect example with who he has come up a lot this week is Richard Jewell from 1996. You know, who was falsely accused of uh, bombing. Um, the um, the, the uh, Olympic Park in, in Atlanta in 1996. That was a false positive. Yeah, it was not a, a false identification. But what do you think about uh, the, the impact of false positives and how it should relate to the use of technology to do surveillance like this? Well, I think what this really does is just give back to the sort of age-old issue of eyewitness testimony. Um, any number of people are convicted of serious felonies every day of the week based primarily or even sometimes exclusively on eyewitness testimony. And there's very, very good research uh, that shows that it is possibly the least reliable form of evidence out there, particularly as we get farther and farther from the, uh, the, 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 the event we're talking about. But everyone knows this. But the courts have shown remarkably little interest in doing anything about it. We have this sort of inherent sense that it's an eyewitness. Everyone trusts their own senses, right? Well, you can think of this as sort of an expansion of eyewitness testimony. Now, not only do we have our own sort of faulty memories to rely on, we have these cameras out there which are recording some of that. Now, in one sense, that might help because... It isn't just our own memories we're relying on. We now have um, a digital record. Uh, David Lynch had things to say about this in some of his films. But there's still the question of identification. So we have this picture. What does it mean? What does it say? Uh, there's been a joke going around the internet now that, you know, the, the <laughs> we're, we're, we're basing our identification of these two guys as wearing hats, well, I'm glad this we're not in the 1950s because <laughs> wearing a, a white hat and a black hat doesn't really tell us very much about anybody. Um, and right now, it looks pretty likely that the suspects that have been identified probably were involved. But they may not have been. We don't know. I certainly don't from where I'm sitting, and I've seen a lot of this footage. Um, so I think it's a real problem. But I think it's kind of of a piece with a lot of problems that are already out there that we seem to have basically decided that we're not going to deal with. We know, why we, we know eyewitness testimony is unreliable, that it's incredibly unreliable. But what, what are our alternatives? Ryan Kahlo, you wrote a piece for CNN uh, last month where you said that we're missing out on the transformative potential of drones, you know, this, this transformative potential that, that, that drones have. And, and also said that rather than seeing an end to drones, you'd rather see an end uh, to bad privacy. I'm wondering if you're willing to talk about um, the, any of the nuances that would have would attach to the situation where if there had been a drone flying over the finish line at the Boston Marathon, capturing images of, of suspects and how that relates to this transformative potential uh, that you talk about. Is there anything to be said about that? 
Uh, well, yeah, I, I remember that the the president of the trade association AUVSI um, uh, maintained in the wake, in the immediate wake of the of the Boston um, bombing, that uh, had we had a drone available um, to respond, then somehow that would have um, improved the situation in some way. Uh, and he was basically sort of. Uh, p pilloried for for using the um, the event as a as a form of self promotion, um, and, and perhaps what he said was not in the best timing or the best taste. Uh, but it's not untrue that had law enforcement had a drone on hand, uh, it's conceivable that they would have um, had an additional tool uh, that would have helped them re respond to the emergency. Whether it was because they could have located people. Um, or because um, it would have helped them coordinate the uh, uh, evacuation of the area and so forth. Um, I, th th then it's probably right that they would have benefited from that tool in some way. Um, I, I think, again, for all the reasons we've been talking about, and I couldn't agree more with, uh, with my co-panelists here, that, that uh, having a drone just sort of flying around uh, looking for things in advance uh, probably would not have done much more than what Bruce Schneier uh, accurately calls security theater. Um, it would be very difficult to, even with the drone, uh, to, to, to be able to find people that you don't know mean you any harm uh, that are wearing hats and backpacks and to figure out that those particular people um, are going to set off uh, more than one uh, bomb. That, that would be next to impossible. So to the extent anyone's suggesting that had we had drones, somehow we would um, uh, uh, have been able to prevent the tragedy, that, that strikes me as obviously not right. Um, that said, you know, the, the transformative potential of drones goes well beyond using them for prophylactic surveillance. I mean, not only can you support the police in appropriate circumstances like emergencies, but in addition, um, you know, you have agricultural uses uh, that do not implicate surveillance in quite the same way. Um, you have uh, uh, interesting um, uh, novel commercial uses like extreme uh, sport photography, uh, uh, photographing wildlife animals. You have the ability to, to go after uh, uh, polluters, potentially. Um, uh, you can you can cover the news I and mean, there's lots and lots of things that you can do with these technologies that are that are potentially really useful and in the end maybe transformative and you know I, I, and I think we should we should be able to go forward with that uh, but I do think that it's just a shame how inadequate privacy law is at the most fundamental level to deal with the nuances that drones and other surveillance technologies create such as the binary conception of public and private as though somehow, um, by being in public, you give up any semblance of, of privacy. And so that's starting to unravel, but it's doing it so slowly. Uh, I think the Jones decision in the United States, the Jones decision last year, signaled on the, a willingness on the part of at least five justices um, to re-examine the idea that you have no expectation of privacy in public. Um, I think that the Jardinas case, the dog sniffing case, um, was uh, was uh, problematic, although I would say that I'm surprised we're not talking more about dog sniffing, because that's something that actually you could have prophylactically presented, prevented this, 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 this problem by having widespread use of dogs. Um, that is something that, I mean, I don't know if it would have for sure, but it, it at least has a more plausible scenario than if you had cameras everywhere. And so that's something we really need to take very seriously. Under what circumstances are we prepared to back off from a constitutional perspective on the use of things like dogs or chemical sensors that are capable of detecting bombs. I think that's a much, much harder question than is there no expectation of privacy in public. And I'm sorry to sort of go off on a tangent, but it occurs to me that that's an interesting angle. Well, that that is an interesting angle. And I'm wondering if there's any, you know, real merit in trying to speculate where this could go, this prophylactic use of high technology, surveillance technologies, facial recognition, stuff like that, you know, as these technologies get more advanced, whether there's any concern that we should be have, you know, that we should have over the where this may be 10 years from now, what I'm envisioning is a drone 
and not necessarily like you know the model airplane kind of drone that I think most people think of when they uh, conjure up the 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 picture of one in in one's mind. Not like you know flies over Afghanistan and Pakistan, but you know maybe maybe even a very small device that's that's going around here. Uh, you know is is what is. Uh, you know what? What should? What kind of concerns should we have? What risks should we see for ourselves when a drone could be equipped with facial recognition technology, for example, that's constantly scanning faces and querying a uh, a private database or public database, uh, looking for something here? I guess the essential point would be, or the essential amalgamation of the of the of the issues would be, what do we do someday when a drone could be as effective? in ferreting things out as a, 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 a contraband sniffing uh, dog. Anything along those lines uh, worth being concerned about? You're asking, okay, um, so there, there are two distinct uh, precedents that we're talking about. One of them says that you have no expectation of privacy in public that society is prepared to accept as reasonable. That is the CATS test as applied to public spaces. And that's going to be primarily um, the conversation around things like facial recognition in public. Um, and there the danger is that, and, and by the way, um, I think it was James already alluded to this. Um, there, there the danger is that, um, or, or apologies if it was Ryan, but um, is that you're, you're, it's going to just be excessive. I mean, you'd be scanning everybody's face, keeping a log of everybody's whereabouts uh, so that on occasion, very, very rarely, maybe you'll have a better shot at identifying uh, people who mean to, to do us harm. Um, it doesn't feel like a cost-benefit analysis that comes out in favor of widespread surveillance. The, the, the precedent having to do with, um, with chemical sniffing or dog sniffing um, is a different line of cases. And those cases don't say that you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in public. What they say is that you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in contraband, no matter where it is, um, including, incidentally, if it's in your house. Because the Jardinas case that was just before the Supreme Court this term, um, the case was decided on the basis of the fact that there was a trespass in order to get the dog onto your property. They didn't tangle with the longstanding notion that if a dog alerts to something that's contraband, you cannot then turn around and claim constitutional protection because society is not prepared to accept as reasonable your subjective expectation of privacy in contraband. So the idea then would be that dogs or drones with chemical sensors that are analogous to dogs would be flying around looking for bombs. They're not keeping a log of all our whereabouts. They're not taking pictures of us. They're only alerting supposedly, um, in the presence of something that you're not allowed to have in public, like a bomb. And so it becomes, it's quite seductive, that line of reasoning. This is, comes from Cabales and from Place and from Edmondson and Jacobson, you know, Edmonds and Jacobson. These are a line of cases, all of which hold that if all the technology or animal does is say yes or no to something that you're not allowed to have anyway, uh, one wonders why you shouldn't be able to have it. And so I'm surprised we're not talking about why in big events like this one, the government is not putting up um, dogs everywhere, chemical sniffers everywhere. That would be a, a thing, something that I think that the court, the Supreme Court, would find was not only not a problem, but doesn't even register constitutionally. It's not even a search for constitutional purposes. Now, what's the danger of that? You know, false positives is the danger. Um, expanding the list of things that are contraband beyond, you know, you know, beyond. Um, uh, bombs is problematic. Like, so what if what they're sniffing for is not just bombs, but like, you know, um, uh, marijuana? Um, what if they're sniffing for um, just things we wouldn't, you know, at, at one point, the Motion Picture Association of America paid to have dogs trained to detect the telltale sign of a newly printed CD to help combat copyright violations, right? You know, so like yeah. what, what, how, how, how much, how long, how much can we sort of, how much pressure can we put on this, on the Kabbalist line of cases? That to me strikes me as a distinct and extremely difficult question. Um, one where I'm not even necessarily sure how I come out. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, one's left to wonder whether the fallout of this is going to be something like what you're talking about, dogs everywhere trying to detect chemicals in much the same way after 9-11, we saw much more increased airport security and, and stuff like that. But but uh, Ryan, I, Ryan Kahlo, I know you need to uh, 
to get off the line here and uh, get back to your job of, of being a professor at the University of Washington. Any final comments along these lines? Because uh, it's left with, uh, with James and the other Ryan here for, for, for us to, to continue the conversation and all the, all the things that are going on here. Any, any final comments, anything you want to plug, any, anything uh, before you sign off? No, I mean, I just want to say that, first of all, I intend uh, when I have a chance, uh, you know, this weekend to watch the remainder of the show because it's so interesting to me and the people that are on are, are so interesting. And so um, I'm sorry to have to hop off now, uh, but I, I intend to come back and revisit the show. The second thing I would say, and I suppose this is a, on, on one level a plug, um, we, we had a big conference last week that, that folks might be interested in at Stanford that's called uh, We Robot Getting Down to Business. It's the second inaugural Robotics in the Law Conference. The first was at Miami, and the conference returns to Miami next year. Um, and we have a bunch of papers and eventually videos of that conference uh, and a lot of uh, news coverage of it uh, if people are interested in the subject of robotics in the law, which we only touched upon in passing. But so basically, you know, check out the conference if you're interested. Um, I look forward to, to watching the rest of this, uh, of this show this weekend. Thanks a lot. Hey, well, thanks for being here, Ryan Kahlo, everyone. So, uh, all right, James, uh, Ryan Davidson, uh, we have uh, the time together, the three of us here to, uh, to talk about some issues. Uh, for those uh, listeners who aren't familiar yet, James, tell us about uh, Law in the Multiverse. What is that? Well, Law in the Multiverse is a blog that I started in November of 2010, and Ryan uh, came on board uh, very shortly after I started it. Uh, we explain legal principles uh, through, with examples drawn from primarily from comic books, but also from other popular media, um, uh, like movies and TV shows. And it's a great, fun way to talk about and explore those fictional universes and also uh, kind of a fun way to talk about and uh, explore the law. Ryan, what is uh, kind of your focus when it comes to thinking about these issues with the law of superheroes and, and other things? What, what things do you find most intriguing? Um, I've always sort of been a fan of legal history. So those uh, issues which let me dig back into the way things used to be are a lot of fun. I wrote a post very early on about the common law sentence of outlawry. Uh, and discuss it as it might apply to supervillains in the modern context. And in a more practical sense, we're starting to see a little bit of that as it comes to the discussion of the resurgence in international piracy. Uh, you know, these bad actors that seem to be outside the range of uh, national governments that we're still dealing with somehow. Um, in my uh, day jobs, I've spent a lot of time dealing with insurance and uh, posts about civil liability uh, tort liability, insurance uh, regulation, and coverage. Those things have uh, been interesting to me as we've written. Well, that might be a, an interesting segue into the question of who should be responsible uh, if a robot does something harmful to someone else. What do you think, Ryan? Where should civil liability apply if somebody's robot goes out and tries to destroy the world? This sounds to me like a fairly standard products liability uh, case. We have an instrumentality, which is made by a manufacturer or someone. Uh, it may have been purchased by a party down the market stream somewhere, and it goes out and someone is injured as a result. Um, what if, uh, go ahead, go ahead. So we, we, we chase the chain of liability back through the person who was using the robot at the time, uh, then maybe back to the manufacturer, see if there was a defect along there somewhere. And just like any other instrumentality, if you injure someone, uh, if you own something that injures someone else, it's probably going to be liability in there somewhere. If robotics, uh, let me ask, ask you, James, if robotics... Um progresses. The science uh, progresses so much that someday robots are completely autonomous. And even though they originally have been created by human beings, they um, maybe have passed some kind of line where they are conscious, where they can actually make their own decisions and um, perhaps come to some uh, sense of responsibility uh, for, for their own actions. This is a very fundamental question in the law of robotics and, and this types, these types of things. Uh, is there a point at which we can stop uh, with the products liability framework uh, that, uh, that Ryan is talking about and go more toward uh, individual liability, culpability to this uh, intelligent agent that has been created? Well, maybe. Um, it's a little hard when talking about robots because there actually haven't 
as far as I've been able to tell, the last time I looked was uh, a few months ago, but but fairly recently, I've not actually been able to see any cases specifically about liability for injuries caused by robots. Uh, and and, I, and by, by robots, I mean like industrial robots or Roombas or something like that, you know, the actual kinds of robots that, that exist today. Um, so there doesn't seem to be much in the way of robot law. Uh, um, so it's hard to even gauge where the courts even begin to see this kind of issue. As far as uh, something like holding the robot accountable on a criminal basis or or a civil basis, I guess, there's a couple of questions. Uh, if you think about it at a civil level, well, w then you have to, what assets does the robot have? Uh, that only, that, that, that approach really only works if the robot isn't judgment proof. I mean, it, it doesn't very, does nobody any good if we say, oh, no, no, it's the robot's fault. Let the robot pay. Well, the robot is broke. <laughs> so that, that, that doesn't do anybody any good. Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, then the whole issue depends on whether or not the, yeah, the, the robot is a person. Uh, the robot uh, has uh, rights and, and responsibilities. Um, again, not a lot of cases about this with regard to robots. A few cases, however, with regard to animals, and uh, including some circuit court cases, and, and uh, or at least one circuit court case, and a handful of district court cases, um, with some people trying to sue on behalf of of. Uh, uh, cetaceans uh, primarily, uh, sort of like dolphins and whales and things, um, trying to uh, say that they should have standing to sue for uh, uh, injuries uh, done to them. Uh, that is to say that the cetaceans should have standing to sue on their own for, for, for themselves. Um, that is to say that rather than the humans having to bring a lawsuit to say, no, don't don't do this thing that is harming the the whales. That the whales would bring the lawsuit in their own name, and then the humans would simply be their representative in court. It's uh, like if someone hurts a young child or someone who is mentally disabled. The lawsuit is brought by the child or the mentally disabled person. They simply have a representative in court because, of course, they can't actually uh, uh, you know manage their own affairs yet. Um, and the court held that. Uh, while it was within Congress's power uh, to extend standing to uh, animals if it wanted to, theoretically, um, that would be such an extraordinary departure from the way things have been done ever um, that um, it would require a very, very explicit statement from Congress. And it certainly would be something that Congress would have to do rather than something that the courts could do on their own. That was what the Ninth Circuit said. Um, so I think that we would probably take the same approach with robots, where we would ha it would have to be something that the legislature did, and they would have to very carefully craft um, uh, craft some kind of standard for uh, for robot personhood. And it would be it would be very difficult because it's, you know even today people disagree even as a theoretical matter what what would be a good way to um, to define, um, you know, conscious or responsible or aware or sentient or intelligent or whatever. Um, and it's difficult because should that even be the standard? Because of course that's not the standard for people. A person who is born with a severe mental disability is still has all of the same rights as any other person, um, except in as much as because of their disability, they might, you know, have to, they might uh, have a, a guardian appointed for them or something like that, but they're still, but they're still a, a legal person. So if, you have a robot that is capable, you know, is intelligence and has all these things, all these rights. Once you have one robot that has this, the, these rights, well, shouldn't all other robots have these rights? Aren't they just arguably mentally disabled or something? I, it's it's uh, it's very it's very tricky. Um, uh, it's very, uh, it's, it becomes very philosophical, um, and I don't know that the law is very well equipped at this point to grapple with those issues. Um, uh, it's, it, it, I think it lacks a very good framework for it, and I think it needs, um, I think it needs uh, uh, a lot of philosophical underpinning uh, before uh, before a good legal framework could then come out of it. Right, uh, Ryan. I know in um, one of your blog posts you talked about this cetacean case. Uh, you know, cetaceans being the the whales and the porpoises and the other marine mammals. And the, the Ninth Circuit held that it didn't have standing 
uh, to, to bring suit for injuries. I think it had to do with the naval use of, of sonar, right? And so, um, I mean, is that an effective line for us to argue uh, when it comes to the responsibilities that non-human uh, intelligent agents may have? Uh, because standing is a right, and it's kind of the converse of an obligation. Is that, um, I, I guess I would be interested in hearing you talk about why we think that if the court is going to set up certain frameworks for standing, the legal right to sue, why that would be the same kind of analysis that would go toward whether or not it had the responsibility of not acting in a way that is criminal or in a way that violates uh, civil common law, like, for example, being negligent or something like that. What's the relationship between standing and the obligation for, for liability? Well, I think the, the issue here is fundamentally capacity um, in, in the legal sense of the term, which is the ability to both sue and to be sued. Um, I don't think there's any entity ever that's had the capacity to do only one of those things. If you can sue someone, you can also be sued by that person or anyone else for that matter. And uh, as I was thinking about this, uh, we did a, I did a series of uh, several posts on non-human intelligence. There's an entire chapter in our book on the subject. I came to the conclusion that legislatures and probably the courts as well are likely to draw a fairly bright line between biological non-human intelligences and artificial non-human intelligences. Um, human beings are people. There's not a whole lot of question as to what constitutes a human being. Here we are. Um, we haven't gotten technically to the point that there's any real fuzziness about that. Um, if a, another biological entity came along and started talking to us and basically asked to be treated as a legal person, it would be very difficult to tell them no. You know, here's something that even though it isn't strictly human, in many senses is very similar to us. They have a body. They have intelligence, whatever that means. They can certainly communicate with us. If something like that showed up and presented itself to the courts, what are they going to do? Say, no, we're sorry. Um, anyone can shoot you who wants to because you're not a human? Mm, that could be a really, really hard sell. On the other hand, robots seem to be fundamentally different. You know, artificial intelligence is run in software on hardware. Some people try and draw a metaphor between the human mind and the human body, but we don't have any idea how that works. And... The difference between a human and a robot is that you can turn a robot completely off and then later turn it back on again and the robot will be fine. You can't do that with people. Uh, when a human being, uh, when its metabolic processes stop, that's, that's the end of it. And you can't copy us. You can copy robots. Uh, if artificial intelligence is our software, they can be copied. Are we now having multiple instances of these people running around? How many of them can we cram into a single PC? Uh, is it involuntary servitude to ask them to do things for us? You know, is it unconstitutional to issue commands on a command line now? This seems way too messy and way too counterintuitive. There is something intuitive about recognizing the legal personhood of a biological non-human intelligence. But there's some very, very counterintuitive results that come along when we start treating artificial entities as being legal persons. So I think that's likely to be a point of interest should this issue ever find its way into the honest-to-goodness legal system. Some of uh, listeners may be seeking MCLE credit for this, and it's our obligation to give a passphrase at this point uh, to prove that you are listening to the show and that you are not robotically uh, taking it all in. Let's make our first pass phrase, non-human intelligence. Um, so James, um, or I'm sorry, Ryan, just to, to stay on, on that point, uh, could we say, I mean, is it, a, is it a line that we could draw that we would extend these rights and obligations on a, uh, I guess you would say at a substrate specific basis, humans, biological uh, substrates for uh, the computation that goes on in having a mind and consciousness versus something else? Or uh, were you actually saying uh, something different than that? 
I think close to that. Uh, I guess I would be resistant to the mind as computer metaphor. Um, it's a useful metaphor, but it is just a metaphor. And the idea that the brain makes calculations, we can talk that way. Is that what's really happening? I'm not sure that we know that. And certainly not in any way that we could represent in a uh, series of logic gates as we do in computers. But I do think that drawing a distinction between biological entities and non-biological entities is a bright line that the courts and legislatures could get their head around and would be very, very easy to enforce. And I, I'm of the opinion that this would run um, along most people's intuitions about these things. James, if we are to um, give rights and obligations to non-human intelligent agents, is it conceivable then that they should have a constitutional due process and more importantly, perhaps an equal protection uh, status? Well, I, I think so. I think that once you've uh, made something a, a you know a person, then, then they're a person. I think that I think that yeah, I think I think so. Um, I think it would be really really uh, dicey to try to um, to try to create like a second class citizen scheme uh, for non-human intelligences and things. I think that I think we've been down that road before, and it um, <clears throat> it, it doesn't go anywhere good. Um, and so, yeah, I, th I think that the, if history is any guide, then the way to, to do it would be to um, to say that they are, you know, on an on, on an equal basis with humans, as much as is at all practical. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think I think that's I think that would wouldn't be pretty necessary. Um, there's been some interesting questions in the Twitter stream, at, or the, the Twitter, stream, the IRC, uh, the the chat room. I don't know if we want to respond to those. Uh, about this topic, yeah. What do you want to What do you want to talk about? Um, uh, some, somebody said something about their, their dog having rights, and I, I wanted to say that uh, that that's a that is a that is a point. That's an interesting point. Um, so in, we don't. Um, you, you're, you're, I'm sorry to say that your your dog actually does not have rights. Um, we we don't have an animal rights model in the United States. We have um, an animal welfare or animal protection model, and that's the case in the in most of the world. Um, so when we talk about when we talk about the case in the Ninth Circuit, um, that was an attempt to bring the United States into an animal rights model where the animals themselves would have rights the way people have rights. Instead, um, uh, well, instead animals have laws that protect them, but the animals, but if those laws are violated, it's not that the dog or the animal um, uh, uh, can bring a, a suit uh, to uh, in response to that violation. Instead, the state. Uh, uh, brings a suit, or the owner brings a, a, a suit, uh, or the state brings a criminal case, um, and that's a seems like a fine distinction. Like, well, who cares? Who, who cares who brings the suit? Like, the, the point is that the the wrongdoer is punished or, or whatever. Um, but um, but I think uh, but uh, for some legal theorists and animal uh, rights proponents, um, I guess it's uh, it's pretty important. So um, so yeah. We, we, Strictly speaking, <laughs> uh, there's we we, do, we don't have uh, animal rights in the United States. We uh, we only have um, we only have uh, uh, animal welfare or animal protection laws. Yes, animals are a species of property. Yeah, um, and uh, another another point was somebody had mentioned about uh, animal animal trials in the in the medieval era, and that's true. There there were uh, animal trials where an animal uh, would cause uh, an injury to a human, and then there would be or to property, and then they would be put on trial. And if they were found guilty, they might be executed uh, or or whatever. And those did happen. Um, but the way to think about that is not that the animal was being held res legally responsible or was considered to have legal responsibilities in the same way that people did. Really, it was more akin to or a uh, predecessor to what what we consider what we would call today an in rim action, an action uh, where the jurisdiction was over the thing, um, and uh, rather than over a person, and um, uh, and that so you, you if you if you look up there's a fun Wikipedia article about a list of in rim it's 
R E M, um, like the band, um, uh, case names and, uh, and yeah, there you go. And, uh, um, it's the, the really fun names like the United States versus $64,000 in cash or, or whatever, or the United States versus so many bottles of Coca-Cola. They've, they've got really fun names. Um, 1971 and, uh, Cadillac or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and it's the same kind of thing today where strictly speaking, the case is brought against some thing, some physical thing. And, and sometimes they involve animals. Um, and it's not that we think that the, Cadillac or the bottles of Coca-Cola are guilty of a crime, but um, but that's what the the jurisdiction is based on. And ultimately, if uh, the the result might be that the that the physical thing is forfeited to the government, and if, if it's contraband, may in fact ultimately be destroyed. Um, so, you know, in in some cases, it's not entirely unlike those medieval animal trials. Um, so. Uh, so anyway, it's it's kind of a, a bit of a digression, but um, uh, but uh, but yeah. So those those trials were a real thing, but I don't think that they really indicated that people considered the animals to be uh, on par with people or to have responsibility, legal responsibility for their actions in quite the way one might think. There's right, another well, uh, question about um, transgenic animals. You know, how much human DNA can a pig have before it starts to have rights? We're not basing in the legal system anymore. We're not basing the definition of personhood on the existence of DNA. It's nothing so technical. It's a pretty much a common sense realism de definition of humanity. <laughs> do you look like a human? Can you talk like a human? Um, do we recognize you as being a person? <laughs> there isn't any strict legal definition for this. You're either a human or you're not. So adding human DNA to a pig wouldn't actually make that a person any more than adding genetically engineered or non-human DNA to a person to treat a disease. Um, that, that isn't the kind of metaphys metaphysics we're dealing with here. Guys, hold those thoughts uh, briefly. We've got to take a quick break uh, to say a word about our, our sponsor for uh, episode 207 of This Week in Law. This episode is brought to you by ShareFile. Uh, it's not only what we do at work, but how we do it that makes the difference. Our flow of information needs to be ongoing, collaborative, and time efficient, whether we're working at the office or on the go. ShareFile helps you do all that easily and securely. ShareFile by Citrix seamlessly integrates into your daily routine, no matter where you are from any mobile device with ShareFile. Files of almost any size are sent as secure links. Notifications are sent to you when they're open to track their progress. Files can be password protected for ultimate control. Uh, plus, you can set up shared folders for easy collaboration with clients and coworkers. Uh, ShareFile will change the way you work to help you get started. They have a free, a special 30-day free trial offer, no obligation, and you'll see the difference right away. Uh, to get this special offer, go to sharefile.com today. Click on the microphone at the top of the home page and enter TWIL, T-W-I-L. That's sharefile.com and enter TWIL. James, so could a uh, robot ever um, vote in a presidential election? Well, that would I think that would really uh, depend on on some of the other issues that we talked about earlier about, uh, you know, not only personhood, but then a citizenship and then, um, you know, reaching the appropriate, uh, voting age, um, and all the, the other uh, appropriate requirements for, for voting. So, um, you know, I guess we, we talked about the possibility of holding them criminally liable for their actions. So in some States, I guess they would have to not be a, a felon, um, uh, and that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, any, I think it, it's certainly possible. Um, uh, you know, it, uh, you know, that's one of the things about the law is that it's, it's ultimately sort of, um, uh, whatever we decide to make of it. So I suppose it's, uh, imaginable. Uh, one of the, when we, we talk about robots, I think that that is something that helps a little bit with Ryan's earlier objection to, um, some of the problems with artificial intelligences, uh, where a robot at least constrains the artificial intelligence to a single entity. And that 
physical entity and that helps a little bit some of those uh, objections um uh and so i think maybe um one problem is that of course uh we might find ourselves in a situation where the robots live a lot longer than the humans do and theoretically they could start to um end up being a majority of the population just by um uh the accumulation of their numbers um which you know that's that's just democracy for you i guess um but i suppose if uh, yeah if they could vote we could find ourselves in a situation where uh humans were the minority and suddenly we have a you know a, a robot congress and a robot president um so um but yeah i think so i think that's certainly possible now i, I think when it comes to something like expanding the definition of um of uh that far of, of things like citizenship that might require require not just an act of congress that might that's something like that might require a constitutional amendment i'm not i'm not sure um but uh yeah that's that's uh that's not something that i've looked into quite as much as some of the other <laughs> some, of, some of the other topics <laughs> right and yeah I, I agree with james it might require that until it comes along i'm not sure we'll ever know um it's it's just such an enormous sea change for what the legal system is and how it works to start talking about expanding the uh, definition of legal personhood beyond humans. Yeah, I, I was kind of puzzled as to why a age requirement would be necessary for a uh, a non-human intelligence to to vote. I mean, if these things are programmed, you could. Uh, I mean, I, I guess the the premise for an age requirement uh, to vote is, you know, the experience that comes with age, the the cognitive development that comes with that to make a good decision as to who to vote for, you know, sane judgment, uh, all of those things which uh, conceivably could be created as emergent properties the very moment of uh, having been programmed. So I'm wondering, uh, James, if, you know, if that constitutional amendment you were talking about would do away with that age requirement for, for those types of intelligences and replace it with some other proxy for uh, good judgment. Well, I mean, I suppose it could be done, but then do we really want the government to administer some kind of good judgment test before you're allowed to vote? Because that seems like the sort of thing that could potentially, I mean, that just seems like an enormous quagmire because the possibility of the test basically being a proxy for who you're going to vote for or, you know, you know trying to tease apart um, any possible correlation between the, the test, uh, uh, and who, who you might vote for, uh, would be just a really, a big mess. And then, uh, yeah, I don't know that, <laughs> I mean, you know, as I say, anything, I, theoretically anything's possible with an amendment, uh, I guess, but, um, that just seems like, um, uh, you know, shades of literacy tests and all kinds of things that we've, you know, it's, again, I don't know that we want to have second class citizenship treatment uh, if we were going to do something like that. This seems like, you know, historically it just hasn't worked out very well. And um, if we really, truly had intelligent, conscious, really on par with human beings in, in pretty much every way, artificial intelligences, I don't know that they would stand for being treated any differently. Um, and But I mean, you know, how would if, we if, even measure the age of an A.I.? Is well, this uptime? From, yeah, sure. <laughs> from, is from, when the program's first published? Yeah, um, no, from when, do, from does when it reset when, every time it patches itself? Ah, uh, who knows? Uh, yeah. it, it would depend. It would depend so much on how it, it on how it worked. Uh, it would it would be really hard to say. Um, but uh, so it would. You think it would be unconstitutional and probably some kind of civil rights violation to require it to, at a minimum, pass the pass a Turing test to to have these rights or to, to vote, to get married, to get a driver's license. Well, that, that's, well, that's self-driving cars. That may be sooner. Well, uh, well certainly as it, as it stands today, you, they don't, you can't do that for humans. I mean, you, for, for in many cases, you, you can't, uh, disc, um, uh, well, say that actually, <laughs> uh, the, the mentally disabled, um, do not have, uh, 
are not are not really a um, uh, protected class in the same way as as, as some other groups. Um, uh, but um, but nonetheless, I think that uh, I think I think that there were like broadly systemic discrimination against them. Where, for example, to to do to do just about everything, uh, you had to you know, pass an IQ test, uh, I think that the court would probably revisit that issue. Um, I think, was that, was that DeShaney? Uh, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, no, that wasn't DeShaney. Uh, I can't remember the name of the case, but the, um, the, uh, the case that, uh, about the, um, whether or not the, the mentally disabled were a, uh, uh yeah. a suspect classification or something. Uh, it, uh, anyway, um, um, anyway, I think, so I think that would be an issue. Uh, a lot of people in the in the uh, IRC uh, thing, and you mentioned, I've been mentioning it as well, and you also mentioned the Turing test. Uh, I, I have a couple of degrees in computer science, and I could just say that um, the Turing test is sort of a, a, a very popular notion about, oh, well, we have this thing that this very, very brilliant guy, Alan Turing, sort of came up with about a, a possible way to determine whether or not an artificial intelligence is um, uh, really intelligent or not. Actually, it's it has a lot of flaws and probably is not as much of a gold standard perfect way to tell whether or not an artificial intelligence is um, is uh, uh, equivalent to uh, to a, to a human um, uh, as a, as a practical matter as as people might think. Um, so I don't I don't know if it's as simple a matter as people might think to say. Oh well. Uh, we just we just say if they can pass the Turing test, then they're good. Um, and in any case, it's still the same problem uh, of you're saying that for some reason artificial intelligences and robots have to effectively pass a a pretty high uh, you know in test of intelligence and reasoning um, and be con you know conversant and um, think on their feet and you know, sociability and all these things that are very implicit in the Turing test um, that human beings just don't, you know, you don't, a human being could totally fail uh, the Turing test and still uh, be able to get a driver's license and be a safe driver at that and, you know, get a perfectly good job that would, you know, pay a living wage, live independently, all these things, you know, uh, uh, make reasonable decisions, voting in election, yada, yada, yada. Um, uh, so, uh, my, my point is, is that, uh, not only, so not only what I think such, uh, such a test, whatever kind of test it might be, probably not be a great idea from a, a legal point of view and probably cause a lot of issues. I don't know that it even makes a lot of sense. Um, because we we don't really allow them from a, for humans, and I think for good reason. Mm -hmm. Let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, never mind. No, go why ahead. don't you go go go, fi go finish that up? Uh, finish sure, that up, Brian. I I think this sort of comes back to the earlier bright line rule I suggested that there's a categorical difference in kind between artificial entities and biological entities. Um, if, if a biological entity exists and any of the members of the class seem to be and act like persons, we sort of recognize that they all are. But how do we, how do we even draw that line with artificial intelligences? We're pretty sure that we don't want the subroutines controlling the spark plugs in your, trans, in your car engine to be considered legal persons. Well, there's a difference in degree between that and what we might describe as full-fledged artificial intelligence. But the difference in kind between us and both of those things. So until we can come up with some actual definition for what artificial intelligence is and means, and honestly, I'm a pessimist. I don't think we're ever going to do that. There's just no way that artificial, that, that non-human intelligences that are mechanical or software in nature are ever going to be recognized as having rights. I would say rather than pessimistic, that might actually be a, a brighter outlook because the kind of future that I fear when it comes to these things is where non-human intelligence actually becomes sentient, becomes conscious. And uh, you know, the, the, the perfect example, I mean, science fiction is, is full of examples like this. And, and it, it seems plausible, at least at a, 
at a, at a highly theoretical level. When you get down to the to mimicking neuroscience and the function of the brain and the 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 radical parallelism that there is in the computing structures and all that stuff, it seems like you know this may never happen. And there's almost good reason to hope that it never does because think of the the suffering that will go on with these beings become conscious, become sentient, to the ability to experience emotion and pain and suffering and the existential fears that we all have about death and, uh, you know, just, just life in general, you know, it's, it's, if we can't clearly draw that line and inevitably the process of drawing that line would be imperfect, uh, at least between now and to the point where we get that line. And then I don't think that line could ever be perfectly drawn. Uh, there's going to be a suffering and I don't think the expansion of more suffering in the universe is a, is a good thing. So, uh, rather than saying it's uh, pessimistic, Ryan, perhaps uh, we could say that let's just hope it, it doesn't get that way. And then we can, you know, clearly draw these lines between human and, and non-intelligent, uh, human and non-human intelligence to not have to, to worry about. So, um, well, I was suggesting a while ago that we shift gears. Why don't we go ahead and do that? Did you guys hear that the House um, passed CISPA this week? This is the uh, the cyber mm -hmm. intelligence uh, bill. Either of you guys uh, following that stuff and uh, have any concerns? Uh, uh, James, what do you think? Uh, I have been following it. Oh, and, and I just wanted to quickly mention the city of Cleburne. Uh, was the Supreme Court case I was trying to think of earlier um, about the, the mentally disabled. Uh, but Got yeah, it. no, I have been following it. And uh, yeah, it has passed the House, uh, not yet the Senate. And as I understand it, President Obama is still uh, still uh, expects to uh, veto it as it stands now. Um, uh, and I think it remains to be seen whether or not it will pass the Senate with enough votes to potentially over, overcome that veto. Um, so we'll see what what comes of the bill as it stands. I think it's very interesting to imagine what the practical effect of the bill will be. Um, you know, in a sense, the main the main thrust of the bill to do with data sharing between private companies and organizations and the federal government. I mean, you know, gosh, that sounds great. Who wouldn't want the people to? help law enforcement uh, uh, catch criminals um, and, you know, of course, private entities and individuals uh, can always, you know, come help out and uh, share information with the government. Um, there's nothing long, wrong with that. And, and generally speaking, it, it doesn't really in, uh, bother the Fourth Amendment when it's um, private organizations voluntarily sharing information, um, but uh, that doesn't usually trigger the, the Fourth Amendment uh, when it's done on a voluntary basis. Um, uh, but um, I think the, uh, some, of the, some of the concerns that, um, that, that you have, uh, that you mentioned before, uh, that um, it might cause people to be wary of handing any information over to private companies, knowing that it's going to be that much more likely that the government will eventually get its hands on it, probably in a very large data mining kind of way. Uh, but I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know if that people will actually have that reaction because if, if uh, we take a look at, uh, so take a page from history, in 1928, the Supreme Court ruled in Olmstead that there was no reasonable expectation, or there was no, there's no Fourth Amendment issue, I should say, the reasonable expectation of privacy came later. There was no Fourth Amendment uh, issue with wiretapping. Uh, the Fourth Amendment didn't apply to telephone conversations, didn't apply to wiretapping, and the, the police didn't need a warrant to get a wiretap. Uh, that was, that was Olmstead. So from 1928 to 1967, that was the law. And then in 1967 with the Katz case, there was the creation of the reasonable expectation of privacy standard and then suddenly uh, wiretaps needed a warrant. But from 1928 to 1967, people certainly used telephones. Uh, they were pretty popular. I mean, I, w I wasn't alive yet, but as I understand it from <laughs> you know, TV and movies and history books, um, people certainly liked telephones. And I don't seem to, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't seem to recall a lot of people being very careful to, you know, thinking, oh, gosh, I'm going to make a phone call, but I better be careful what I say. The police could be listening at any time because, you know, they don't need a warrant. I didn't I don't I don't get that really that impression that that's how people thought about things in the 30s, 40s and 50s and early 60s. <coughs> 
So while CISPA might lead to a lot of government data mining, or at least more uh, and that kind of thing, I don't know if it'll actually actually lead to people really changing their behavior. Ryan, what do you think? Uh, I mean, is is James onto something pointing to the fact that people weren't afraid to make phone calls in most of the 20th century before there was Fourth Amendment protection that the courts told us there was a Fourth Amendment interest here? Um, you know, isn't, you know, a bunch of data uh, stored in the cloud a little bit different than, you know, phone calls over over party lines in the 1930s? Um, anything, anything to that? Or is, is James uh, right in saying that uh, f- because of, well, I don't want to put words in James' mouth, so we'll just leave it at that. I think that, um, I was thinking about this as, as we're doing the show and some of the reading I've been doing, and something that occurred to me was connected to what we were talking about with Ryan and Kayla, which is the vast majority of us are carrying around GPS devices that are identifiable with the owners. And there's no obvious reason to me that information about the constant position of these things could not be stored somewhere. And if that database existed, SISTA would seem to provide the government with access to it. Um, I see this providing two advantages to law enforcement. One would be identifying potential suspects. I still think that the prophylactic uses are too technically difficult because there's just so much information to be observed all at once that it's easy to pick out the information you need after the fact, but it's almost impossible to do it ahead of time. But with this data in mind, you can narrow down on a specific place at a specific time and say, who was here at this time? And all of a sudden, you now have a list of, you know, 50 suspects instead of the 10,000 people that may have passed through the area at some point that day. Uh, You also get a potential list of witnesses, some of whom may actually have uh, documentary evidence of what happened in the form of video or pictures. That's incredibly valuable, both for the criminal justice system and the civil one. Uh, There are any number of civil cases where uh, the case could be completely changed by the existence of uh, pictures or video. And in many cases, this stuff probably exists, but the parties have no way of finding out who created it and who has it. So it's as if it never existed at all. So... Those are the issues that I was thinking about as we were talking about the, the Boston situation. So, oh, yeah, CISPA is coming into play here. We, there's the potential for an enormous database of GPS movements that this could turn over to the authorities. You know, there was a, a piece on uh, MSN's website um, pretty soon after the, the bombings that was talking about some of the privacy implications here. And uh, Brian Pascal, who is a fellow at Stanford CIS, he may be a colleague of Ryan Kalos or has been in the past, I guess, um, was talking about uh, some of the risk uh, or the, the privacy concern that perhaps we should have what he characterizes as the secondary usage of information that is collected uh, in the context that, that Pascal was talking about. Uh, Brian Pascal, that is, not to be confused with Blaze <laughs> Pascal, um, you know, was was talking about it was, you know, we have all these images taken by each other, little brother, so to speak, all of us using our high resolution cameras on our cell phones. This isn't necessarily big brother taking the pictures. And, you know, we turn over this vast data set to the authorities and they use it to mine um, you know, finding the guy in the black hat and the white hat and, and, and all of that stuff, using it for purposes of this investigation. But then there's this risk that, you know, this data is going to be kept around for a, a, a long time, perhaps perpetually. You know, the web means the end of never forgetting. Why not, um, you know, these data sets meaning the end of, of never or the end of forgetting, not the end of never forgetting, but the end of forgetting. So, you know, the, Brian Pascal's examples, um, you know, to, to add a little more detail, you know, what about the picture of the guy uh, smoking marijuana in one of these photos? I don't know many people would, would you use a dugout or something, you know, while you're standing on the street corner there in, in Boston. But, you know, what have you or, you know, a more simple explanation would be a guy jaywalking, a person jaywalking there. You catch them, them and, you know, what's the what's the responsibility that law enforcement has to use that data uh, there? Um, I'm wondering if either one of you would be willing to comment on whether CISPA, uh, you know, truly ex- uh, exacerbates that risk uh, to to our civil liberties, to our privacy interests, because 
if CISPA is enacted, as we've, I guess, only kind of established by implication, what it would mean is that these third party uh, providers who collect information could turn over to the government with impunity any uh, information that you know is the cyber threat information, which is very loosely defined and could could mean a, a number of different things. Um, James, what about what about you? Would you be willing to comment on that risk of the secondary usage of this information? Well, yeah, I think it's certainly <clears throat> certain, very very likely. I think um, what we've seen with um, some parts of the law, for example, the census and I believe tax information and a few other things that that uh, there's some some parts, some information that people give the government where there are rules, uh, for example, with census information, um, there where there are rules that it's confidential and in fact, it can't be used to the legal detriment of the respondent, except of course, if you're if it's alleged that you were violating the census laws. Um, uh, so there's some some uh, things where uh, the government has specially set up laws where, yes, you have to give us information, but we're very careful to make sure that uh, we won't do anything uh, to hurt you with it um, because we really need the information for some very particular purpose. Um, I think another example is that, uh, strictly speaking, you're supposed to pay taxes on drugs like marijuana. And uh, so if you buy marijuana, you're supposed to pay uh, marijuana tax. Uh, but uh, it's but uh, but also but sort of the quid pro quo for that is that they can't take the fact that you paid your marijuana tax and use it to um, uh, uh, to investigate you for or charge you with the fact that you have possess marijuana. Uh, and uh, so the, uh, there are uh, there are some some things like that. The census example is probably a little better, uh, where uh, the government like takes care to make sure um, uh, the that you um, that you uh, uh, they won't misuse the information. And I think that that points to the fact that in every other case where they don't do that, they will in fact use the information for every imaginable purpose. Um, and um, uh, the, um, the, uh, I think that's exactly what will happen with, with, with this kind of data is that it, to the extent that there are not very careful safeguards on how it gets used and by whom the result will be that as soon as it's given to the government for one purpose, it will get passed around. And because that's another thing that we're, uh, the, is considered to be a very important thing that we should do these days is that government agencies should share information and we shouldn't have silos and that it's very important that we have clearing houses and unified databases and interagency cooperation and access that once it's passed to one agency for one purpose, it'll get seen by every agency and used for every purpose. And um, so, you know, yeah, I think that it's extremely likely that, um, that there'll be knock on effects and bystanders get caught up for one thing and another uh, if there are not safeguards. And I think that what we're seeing is that there are not a lot of safeguards um, and so, uh, in the law. And so, yeah, something, information might get handed over because of a, you know, cyber threat or whatever. But if along the way somebody happens to notice something that is <clears throat> not at all cyber related, well, the cat's out of the bag. Um, so, uh, you know, there's no, um, there's no, uh, no reason not to use the information at that point. Right. Ryan, any reaction to that? Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I think I share most of James concerns that once this data is out there and the government has their hands on it, they're going to try and use it. And every branch of the government is going to try and use the information as best they can. But I think that might sort of be where the hitch comes in. We're talking about a vast amount of data. And it's <laughs> a lot of prosecutors' offices are already swamped with a volume of information that they've got to deal with as it is. You know, increasing that by two orders of magnitude with these electronic databases isn't going to help them solve the problem of how to sift through all of this stuff to find what they're looking for. And yeah, big data and data mining have some uh, promise in solving that solution or furthering that problem, depending on how you think about it. 
but it isn't just the, the, the problem of false positives, but also the problem of false negatives. We'll see some stuff that's not there, and we'll miss some stuff that is. Mm -hmm. um, certain kinds of data uh, we're, we're pretty good at handling. Other kinds we're just not. And if it's things like um, surveillance footage or um, GP, even, th even the like GPS location, the fact that this data exists doesn't necessarily mean that we can do anything useful with it just yet. So, uh, again, I think that this is a problem and that we need to think carefully about it. But I think there are some real technical issues here and even just manpower issues that may mitigate some of these bad effects at least for a little while. All right. Which one of you guys wrote about the New York City uh, ban on superhero costumes in public places? Which one is that on Law and the uh, Multiverse? I think that, that was uh, mostly my post there. Yeah. What's that all about? What are those bills? What do those bills say? What's the, what's the concern here? Um, I have to be honest. I have not read the text of the proposed language. I'm not even sure that there is much of it. Um, what I saw was a news item saying that a New York City councilman... Um, is proposing a regulation or an outright ban of costume characters uh, related to some of the bizarre and unpleasant uh, incidents that they've had with people dressed up, especially as Sesame Street characters, but other, other characters as well. There was this sort of anti-Semitic Elmo in Central Park. And um, I think a small child was assaulted by a different person wearing a Sesame Street character costume in uh, Times Square. And he just thought that this, uh, the, the councilman thought this was completely unacceptable and is proposing some way of controlling this. And my first thought well, well I, I had sort of two immediate thoughts. The first one was, there's probably some First Amendment issues here. Uh, the other one was, wait a minute, superheroes are going around in costumes. This seems to be a real world law that might affect some of the fictional stories that we write about. That's at least worth a post. Um, the, the two proposals uh, that he's put forward, um, this, I think they're alternatives. One seems to be an outright ban on the wearing of costumes in public places. I think that's problematic. Uh, the Supreme Court has recognized that the wearing of clothing and costumes is at least potentially expressive conduct under the First Amendment. So completely banning it may not be constitutional. His other um, suggestion was to regulate this activity. And I think this is uh, more plausible uh, regulations that just outright ban speech are heavily disfavored by the courts. But regulations that target, um, that, that impose uh, neutral, uh, content neutral regulations on the time, place, and manner of expression are easier to get through. So if you said you're not allowed to wear costumes while you're panhandling, they could probably do that. Uh, or they could say, if you're going to wear costumes in a public place, uh, you have to uh, register. Uh, maybe they can do that. That might look a little bit like prior restraint, which the courts don't like. Um, but if they targeted at specific areas, so like, you know, you have, to wear, you have to register to wear a costume in Central Park or in Times Square. That's looking a little more plausible. Um, the other thing that he proposed was requiring anyone wearing a costume character to carry on their person evidence that they have permission from the person or persons that created this character uh, to wear this costume. Um, I think this is problematic, and James may have more to say here, because now we're talking about sort of state implementation and enforcement of copyright laws, and copyright is exclusively federal. Uh, uh, Congress has completely occupied that field of regulation, and the states and local governments are really not going to be able to do much to enforce copyright. So all of those things are sort of in the post. And then there's the related issue of, you know, how would this affect Spider-Man? <laughs> you know, the, the, the Fantastic Four are public figures that regularly go around in costume. Um, you know, what's a costume? You know, mm -hmm. I mean... I've been to New York. I've been to Brooklyn and the Lower East Side. 
people wear stuff. <laughs> What's to say this is a costume and that's not just, you know, going out to a bar? Um, eh. Uh, and if they tried to solve that issue by specifically targeting it to pre-existing character costumes, now we run back into the copyright problem. And the states aren't really allowed to try and add extra regulations there. So mm, uh, I, I yeah. just thought that this was an interesting issue to talk about on the blog. What do you think, James? Any reaction to that? Uh, yeah. So uh, <clears throat> excuse me. there was a Supreme Court case several years ago, uh, Bonito Boats. That uh, was was sort of dealing with patents, but the patent and copyright clause is all of a piece in the Constitution that held that uh, not only can the states not uh, not try to do their own state patent or copyright law, they can't even do anything similar. Uh, the, the, the issue in that case had to do with uh, a California law that tried to protect um, boat hull designs, the designs of boat hulls. Um, and uh, the court said, no, that's too close to something that's kind of vaguely like a patent. And um, so they struck it down um, and uh, under this, uh, the supremacy clause, uh, well, pr the preemption aspect is uh, under preemption. And um, I think that this would, that would, this might very well run into that same issue. Um, uh, and it, it could possibly be justified under more of a state trademark basis. They could say, oh, no, 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 this isn't copyright uh, or even federal trademark. Uh, what we're trying to do is um, we're trying to say if you've read, if you have a state, a New York state trademark, uh, and we're uh, on, on this character, um, then we're trying to help you enforce that state trademark. Um, but that might even have problems because it's a New York City bill that they're trying to do. And I, who knows? I don't know about how the uh, uh, separation of powers or whatever between uh, sort of state federalism issues in New York between the, the state government and the, and the local governments. Well, uh, uh, <clears throat> but yeah, that, that, that could definitely be an issue uh, with, uh, with even the um, that sort of narrower regulation approach. Uh, so pretty much however they try to slice it, it could be, it could be tricky to um, – to actually accomplish this, um, and um, I think it might be simpler for them to just keep a closer eye on the panhandlers in Times Square rather than trying to, um, you know, pass some really difficult to define bill telling people what they can and can't wear in New York. Right. And right. To, to go along with that, these panhandlers were already doing things that were illegal. You know, it turns mm -hmm. out assaulting eight-year-old boys, you can already be arrested for that. You, you don't need any kind of extra regulation to say, oh, and it's especially bad if you do it while wearing an Elmo costume. Well, whatever, man. You can, the assault is the main problem here. Right. Yeah. It might aggravate it a little bit, but not in a legal sense, perhaps. So, good. All right. Well, um, we're about ready to finish up here. And as uh, listeners and viewers of the show know, we finish up each episode with a tip of the week and a, and a resource of the week. A couple of tips uh, this week. I don't know if you guys, uh, James and Ryan, you took a look at this in, uh, in our show notes to prepare for today. But um, there was this guy out in Hawaii who uh, was having a good time and was driving around in his car filming himself drinking beer. And kind of, I don't know really what he was saying, kind of, uh, you know, going out with a renegade attitude. And uh, it turns out he posted that video of himself uh, online and the cops showed up, I think, you know, a matter of weeks later, certainly uh, an amount of a sufficient amount of time later for the alcohol to get out of his system. And he was arrested uh, for drinking and driving. Did you guys take a look at this article? Any, uh, any reactions, any uh any uh, reason that you wouldn't join in uh, having one of the tips of the week being don't post videos of yourself drinking uh, and driving? James, did you take a look at that? Uh, yeah, so I would definitely agree. Uh, do not film yourself committing crimes. I think, yeah. I think I feel pretty good saying that after, yeah, after three years of law school, I think I feel good about that one. Ryan, were you concerned at all about the evidentiary issues? Uh, you know, there was no, if there was no breathalyzer test, no real evidence that that was actually alcohol or anything like that. Anything to be concerned about with that? 
Well, one assumes that the video was not the only evidence that they had. Presumably, they were able to line up some witnesses as well. Um, but that video certainly sent them on the right track. And the fact that it's posted out on the Internet means that there's really no Fourth Amendment issues in terms of uh, needing a warrant or expectations of privacy. It's out there. He made it public. Um, right. So... <laughs> yeah, don't don't film yourself committing crimes. And should you be tempted to do that, don't post them on the Internet. <laughs> yeah, I brought it up on the show before, you know, this this case of uh, a guy who was um, he was on probation and he got sent back to jail for violating the terms of his probation. Two of his conditions of probation were no alcohol and no using the Internet. And guess what piece of evidence they used to revoke his probation? It was a picture of himself on MySpace drinking beer. So talk about killing two birds with one stone. That's uh, you can definitely uh, you can definitely shoot yourself in the foot, so to speak, uh, with that. And the other tip of the week is uh, get divorced before you get married again, or uh, at least keep your wives separate off of uh, Facebook or separate on Facebook. This is a story. Uh, I don't even know where this came from. I don't. Uh, I don't. I don't know which uh, which state. Uh, but uh, short. A uh, long story short, this guy, um, you know, had left his his wife, first wife, in. Oh, this was in uh, Washington, and the guy was uh, arrested for bigamy. And you know, he had he and his wife had separated in two thousand nine, and uh, he purportedly got married again. And uh, the, the way that he found out here was that his new wife found out and actually friended his previous wife uh, through the people you may know feed on Facebook. So talk about social media kind of uh, betraying someone uh, in this uh, situation. Um, either of you guys had any problems uh, like this, keeping, keeping your personal life straight uh, on social media, James? Uh, no, I... <laughs> <laughs> don't and uh i also try pretty hard not to over sh overshare um but yeah big bigamy is definitely a thing and also there aren't a lot of uh, aren't a lot of good defenses uh to bigamy it's kind of a strict liability kind of thing for the most part like you just kind of have to not be married if you're going to get married again Ryan is uh, James to be believed because he seems so, you know, put together and everything. Is he really kind of wild and, and betrays himself on, on social media like this? No, I, I think he's pretty much uh, shooting straight there. Um, uh, basic tip here would be, you know, unfriend your exes. I mean, seriously. <laughs> There's no yeah. good reason for this. None. None. No. No, no. Um, all right. Resources of the week. Uh, the first of which is, um, you know, if you're if you're so inclined to be against CISPA, it's really more important uh, than ever now to let your senators know it passed the, the House this week. And the EFF has a really good tool uh, that automates the process of informing your legislators that uh, that that uh, CISPA is a bad idea. Uh, if you go to uh, this is a shortened URL, if you go to e 74 dot us slash v f uh that will take you to the eff's tool uh that uh, makes it very easy you just enter in your zip code uh and it comes up with this uh wizard so to speak so that you can easily communicate with your representatives uh letting them know that uh, cispa is bad okay and that uh, that your senators should uh, should vote against it so uh, go take a look at that and if you don't like cispa uh, let them know in Washington. The final resource of the week is um, Law in the Multiverse, uh, the book by uh, that James and uh, Ryan uh, have written. Tell us about, uh, can you give us the elevator pitch on, on that book, uh, James? What's, uh, what's the well, book all about and where can you find it and what's, what's in it? Yeah, the, the Law of Superheroes is, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, kind of an expanded, revised, updated and illustrated version of of what kind of the same stuff we talk on the blog uh, talk about on the blog. Um, the blog, for the most part, does not really have pictures or anything. But uh, on the um, in the book, we do uh, have uh, examples, uh, you know, taken from Marvel and DC Comics, uh, showing uh, kind of what we're talking about um, in the in the book. Um, 
which can be pretty helpful because occasionally we talk about some relatively obscure uh, comics, um, uh, which can be nice. And uh, it's available all over the place, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, the iTunes bookstore, uh, you name it, uh, both uh, as a hardcover and uh, electronically. Great, great. And, uh, well, we're about ready to finish up. We need another MCLE passphrase. For those of you who are trying to get MCLE credit, let's just make that multiverse. Multiverse is the second MCLE passphrase. So, uh, really fun conversation, guys. Really, uh, really have uh, enjoyed it. Uh, Ryan, what do you have going on? Anything you want to plug uh, besides the book? Uh, are you have any speaking gigs? Anything uh, new and exciting going on uh, in, in the near future? Um, I will be presenting at the Mensa Regional Gathering in Washington, D.C. next month. Um, I'll be giving the keynote address. That is on May 18th. Uh, those of you who know what that is can uh, look it up there. Uh, I'm not sure I have a web address for you, but that's that's my next speaking engagement. James, what about you? What's new uh, and going on in the near future? Uh, I'm actually uh, in Arkansas today uh, and tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to be speaking at the uh, the Arkansas Literary Festival, giving a talk, uh, doing a panel discussion with uh, Travis Langley, a professor and uh, author of, uh, of a book about uh, the Batman and psychology. Very cool. All right. Uh, everybody check out, uh, what's the URL? Is it lawinthemultiverse.com? Yep. Is that right? And are you guys on the Twitter? Uh, yes, we are Law AT Multiverse uh, on Twitter. Very good, very good. Should well, I've really enjoyed our conversation. A lot of fun today. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in, everybody in IRC. Uh, next week, Denise will be back, and so uh, you know we'll uh, have, have a good time as, as well then. But uh, thanks also to Ryan Kahlo, who jumped off, uh, jumped off uh, you know, uh, earlier in the show. Uh, James and Ryan, thank you very much. Uh, and everybody, we... Uh, We'll see you again this time next week for episode 208. Uh, that is a wrap on episode 207 of This Week in Law. Thank you. Thank you.